Welcome to today's Zoom event, Early Israeli and American Artist Revisioning the Holocaust, which is organized in honor of Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day. Starting tonight, we commemorate both those who per perished in the Holocaust and those who survived its horrors. I'm Rachel Stern, Director and CEO of the Fritz Asher Society for Persecuted, Ostracized, and Banned Art, which researches, discusses, publishes, and exhibits artists whose life and work were affected by the German Nazi regime between 1933 and 1945. I'm honored to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Ori Scholtes, who teaches at Georgetown University a range of disciplines from art history and theology to philosophy and political history. He's the former director of the Nebert Klutznik National Jewish Museum and has curated more than 90 exhibitions across the country and overseas. He has authored or edited 25 books and several hundred articles and essays. Recent volumes include Our Sacred Science, How Jewish, Christian, and Muslim, draw, uh, Muslim Art Draw from the Same Source, the Ashen Rainbow, Essays on the Arts and the Holocaust, Tradition and Transformation, Three Millennia of Jewish Art and Architecture, and Growing Up Jewish in India, Synagogues, Ceremonies and Customs from the Bnei Israel to the Art of Siona Benjamin. After Ori Scholte's talk, there will be time for Q&A. So please post your questions in the Q&A or the chat function. Welcome, Ori. Thank you so very much. It's a pleasure. It's always a pleasure to be with the Fritz Hauser Society, to be on Zoom with audience. I see a few people who signed in and saying where they're from, a few whom I, of whom I know. So it's great to see familiar and unfamiliar faces. What I want to talk about uh, is uh, briefly uh, a handful of artists, just a handful, both from Israel and from the United States, who are not typically thought of as artists who focus on the Holocaust. Uh, you understand, of course, that that very phrase, Holocaust art, poses a kind of definitional series of conundra. Do we mean subject matter, the Holocaust? Does it have to refer to artists, on the other hand, who somehow managed to make art during the Holocaust or artists after the Holocaust, in which case, does it need to be survivors or does it need to be second or third generation offspring and their offspring of survivors? Or is anyone who wishes to respond to the Holocaust who makes Holocaust art? And of course, another question is when we're looking at the category Holocaust art, do we look at it through the same kinds of lenses through which we look at art in general? I look at a work of art, I look at it in terms of its subject, I look at it in terms of its symbols, I look at it in terms of its style, and of course I look at it in terms of whether I like it or not. Is it beautiful or is it ugly? Do I think it's good art or bad art? And to a certain extent, of course, those are subjective evaluations. But when one turns to art that focuses on the Holocaust, if I am, let's say, talking about an artist who was managing to make art at Theresienstadt concentration camp, for example, would I even dare to think of it in terms of aesthetic terms, or would I not be entirely focused on what this individual is doing as a record of what was going on? Whereas conversely, when I look at art that was made after the Holocaust, and that of course will be my focus today, can I inject my subjective sense of whether it's good art or not, or am I also, once again, thinking in terms of what is it that the artist is trying to say about the Holocaust? And again, would I subdivide it between those who were survivors and those who were not? So my starting point is an artist, in fact, who not only is almost never spoken of except by me as an artist who has addressed the subject of the Holocaust, but who, when he was at the apogee of his fame, in the 1950s and early 1960s, Barnett Newman was written about as an abstract expressionist by the key theorists and art historians and art critics of the era who were incidentally both Jewish, Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg, as someone who like his fellow abstract expressionists was all about form, was all about line, was all about color, 
was not at all about content. And I've been arguing now for, oh my God, 40 years, that the abstract expressionists, as much as they were about form, were also about content. That they could not, being artists, being humans, ignore the world around them, which had gone from Auschwitz to Hiroshima in a really quick period of time, which had exploded. And the activists, like Jackson Pollock, tend to reflect that in the explosions on their canvases, or in the case of the chromaticists, like Barnett Newman, trying to put the canvas, trying to put the world back together on the canvas. So I'm going to show screen, share screen, excuse me. And you are all, I trust, seeing this image, correct, Rachel? Yeah. Okay. So this is one image from a whole series that Newman did between 58 and 66. And it's called, uh, the series is called The Stations of the Cross. Lama Sabachthani. So Stations of the Cross, obviously a subject which is very Christian when we ordinarily think of it. And yet this is a Jewish artist depicting it in his typical style, which is completely abstract. And he adds the subtitle from Aramaic, the phrase that Jesus is quoted in the gospels as having uttered on the cross, Lord, oh Lord, why have you forsaken me? Lama Sabachthani. That's what he adds to the subject. And you're thinking, all right, what is a Jewish artist doing with this subject? And what is his intention? Well, it turns out that he has done a whole series of works, 14 of them, that offer you the equivalent of the Stations of the Cross. And they're all white with the occasional black strip. He called them zips, here, there, whatever. And if you think about it conceptually, and the image of the Stations of the Cross that is normally figurative. It's Christ going up the Via Dolorosa to Golgotha, and he's stumbling, he's carrying this heavy thing on his back. So it's a step, start, stop, start, stop, start. And you realize that's what he's done completely abstractly, this completely white canvas, but with these little strips of black here and there, but no two of them are identical. And then he adds a 15th image, and that's the one I'm showing you here, which is actually called B, B-E, two, Roman numeral two, only there is no Roman numeral one. And it's the only one that is structured the way you see it here with a very carefully placed black line on the right edge and an intentionally different rough edged line in red on the other side. And I'm thinking to myself, if the 14 stations of the cross is cross to the stations of the cross, then they yield Golgotha, where the crucifixion takes place. And that's what we have here, completely abstract, except Barnett Newman is taking this very Christian subject and handling, handling it from a very Jewish perspective. Jews don't depict figurative, figuratively God, and Jews don't believe that God assumed a figurative form as Jesus. So if I want, as a Jewish artist, somehow to convey the idea but in terms that work for me as a Jewish artist, first of all, I'm using abstraction. Second of all, most of the canvas is absolutely empty. It's devoid of color. It's white. It's pure, colorless white, even though at the same time, white can be construed as the totality of color because white is a stand-in for light. And light by way of spectroscopy, we understand, is full of every color, even beyond what you and I can see, ultraviolet at one end, infrared at the other end, beyond where we can see, so that this is the absence and the presence of color. I would say the absence and the presence of God, but I'll say more about that in a moment. This is the only one of the 15 images that has any color at all, by the way. All of them, as I said, are white with just a strip here or there of black, this is the only one we've got red, which in case you didn't figure that out is the color of blood. I might also answer, uh, uh, point out that black and red together in Renaissance symbolism are, are the colors of purgatory, the ascent that you make from hell to heaven. So my suggestion with this image and the larger group of which it's part is that he is handling a quintessentially Christian subject from a very Jewish perspective. And furthermore, he's hinted that to us why is he called the B, B-E? He surely is thinking of Exodus 3, 14, when Moses 
confronting this bush that burns without being consumed, without turning to ash, has a conversation with a voice that emanates from it that we take to be the voice of God, who instruction, guy, you've got a job to do. You got to go back to Egypt, et cetera, and so forth. And when Mo says to God, oh, by the way, who shall I say sent me? Because people are going to ask, who's the guy who told me to come here? God's response is, eh, yeah, asher, eh, yeah. I am will be that I am will be. Or put another way, don't ask me for my name. Names define someone across most of human history and geography. That's the idea of a name. It contains the essence of its bearer. But my essence is isness, is being itself. What I am is that I am. That I am is what I am. You can't really name me. So, well, you know what? Tell them the God of their fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob sent you. They'll get that. So rather than trying to convey his un, the God's unconveyable essence, what God in the end says to Moses, tell them who I am in terms of whom I've dealt with and what I've done in the past, and that will analyze it for us. That will give it that that will give them a way to understand. So this, of course, is one image from Newman. It's not Holocaust, but it carries us beyond what Rosenberg. Greenberg and everybody else, when they looked at this stuff, thought about, which is, oh, this is interesting. It's all abstraction because it's got real content to it. So when I turn to an image like this, and yes, I did just change images, this is called the name. Two. Again, there's no one. It's the name. Done earlier in 1950. It's a canvas, as you can see, it's here at the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. It's not overly large, but you can see it's completely white with two very thin strips that subdivide in a sense um, to give us, uh, well, what is a kind of triptych? And again, the question is, what is going on here? And the answer is, first of all, if I, as a Jewish artist, I, Barnett Newman, am trying to give a sense of God, if I'm trying to fit myself into the history of Christian art, which for 18 centuries, 19th centuries has been largely, uh, sorry, Western art, which has been largely Christian art for 18 or 19 centuries, in which such a common form is the triptych, in which God is depicted in the center, Christ on his mother's lap, Christ on the cross, flanked left and right by the two thieves on Mount Golgotha, or flanked left and right by two or more saints. But I can't depict God that way as a Jewish artist, as a Jew. What can I do? If I use white, which as I said a moment ago is both the absence and the totality of color, I've depicted that which cannot be depicted. I've given you a painting, which in a sense is not a painting because there's no color yet there's color. I've done it in a triptych form, which is the traditional cryptic, triptych form. And I've also addressed, and this is why it's Holocaust art, that theodicy question that emerges in the context of the Holocaust, theodicy, theos dk, the, the justice of God. How can an event in which over a million children are fried in ovens be permitted, be allowed, be countenanced by a God that is understood traditionally by Jews, by Christians, by Muslims, to be all powerful and all good, all merciful and interested, involved in human affairs? And the answer is the only ones even fit to address the question are those who suffered through it and survived. And of those, there were those for whom I'll never believe in God again. There is no God. After I saw what happened, forget it, gone, finished. And there are others for whom I wouldn't have survived without God. That's what enabled me to survive. I believe more fervently than I would have or than I did before. So God was both present and absent at Auschwitz. Just as paint, pigment, color is both present and absent on this canvas, which is delivered as a triptych with a God that can't be seen, and yet a God that is present and there. And in case we didn't know, he's entitled it. He's titled it for us, the name. Everyone who knows anything about traditional Jews knows that, other than the context of prayer. One doesn't even say in Hebrew, Adonai, 
one substitutes Hashem, the name, and Adonai is already a circumlocution because the actual spelling that we pronounce that way bears no correspondence to those sounds. It's yud hey vav hey Y-H-V-H, Yahava, Yahawa, Yah, who knows? Because God's real name is ineffable. And we already learned from the previous image and the conversation that Moses had with God that even that is incomprehensible. So Adonai is a circumlocution, and even that I don't say, I say a double circumlocution. I say Hashem, and if I'm speaking English, the same is true. Instead of saying God, I say Hashem, but the English translation of Hashem is the name. So he's told us that he's depicted God without depicting God, that he's used a visual circumlocution as a stand-in for a verbal circumlocution, and in so doing, he is not only wrestling with the question of where I as a Jewish artist fit into Western Christian art, but where I as a Jew so aware of the Holocaust, the suffering through which we just went, address that as I must as an artist, address it on the canvas with this visual circumlocution. If we turn to an Israeli artist, Mordechai Ardon, who was born in 1906 in, uh, in Poland, and um, that's not wrong, that's not right. It, that was born at Newman's birth year, it's 1894, I don't know why. Anyway, 1894, he lived to be 96, maybe that's where the six came into my head. And who arrived to Palestine, well, he came from Poland to Germany. He started at the Bauhaus, he was very influenced by that. He was um, uh, neighbors with Paul Clay for a long time, very influenced by him, influenced by Kandinsky, came to early Palestine, at the, the dawn of the Nazi era in 1933, 1934, was quite untaken with it because it just seemed so rough hewn. And then one night, one of his friends decided to take him to the Kotel, to the wall. And if you remember, those of you who are old enough to remember before 1967, which is to say before 1948, 49, it was a fairly narrow area before the wall, which seemed to tower over one. And on Shavuot, the, the time that commemorates the bringing of the Ten Commandments down from Sinai by Moses to the Israelites, on Shavuot, the traditional Orthodox communities from Jerusalem and in and around Jerusalem would go to the wall to pray intensely because there's a tradition that at midnight, the heavens open up at that spot and your prayers will have a, a better chance of being heard by God if that's where you're uttering them. So Ardon came to the wall at that time and he was just blown away, the emotion, the feeling. And he said, this was in an interview. I, I interviewed him back in 1984 in his studio. He said, I felt like I've been here before. I've come home. I'll never leave this place. So from someone who was thinking, my God, I'm gonna go back to Germany or Poland, he stayed. And of course he ended up becoming one of the more prominent of the artists in Israel. He became the head of the Pizzalo Academy. In the 50s, he became the, um, the uh, minister of education. And on the one hand, by the 50s, he was saying, look, we Israelis have to create Israeli art. We can't be in, in servitude to European and American styles and subjects. We've got to find our own vocabulary. And his is a unique one. You can see in this work that it is a kind of paradox of both dark and light where you don't really have a horizon line. You can't tell whether you're looking into the depths of the sea or up into the depths of the sky. Are those stylized elements supposed to be stars and planets and perhaps, perhaps a, uh, a moon that is a, a crescent and so on? It's got this wonderful combination of blues and greens, which are particularly indigenous to the doorways and windows of the Arab houses that are found throughout the region going back through centuries. But you'll notice the most particular figure that you can see along the bottom is actually identifiable as a, an archeological artifact that dates from about 3500 BC. It's the Venus of Beersheba. So it's an artifact found in the even pre-Canaanite period going back to the Bronze Age. And you can see that um, it's, uh, he's shown it lying as it were on its, uh, on its back. The head is missing. What is most noticeable is a prominent belly with a prominent umbilicus. It's about fertility and so on. 
But the point is both that image and just to its left, those kind of bird-like images all date from the archeological era that is pre-Canaanite, pre-Hebrew, pre-Israelite, pre-Judean, pre-Jewish, pre-Israel. It's about digging beneath the surface of the land itself, because this is after all around Beersheba in the Northern Negev, to give us a sense of where he has come, where we have come from and his sense that we Israelis are Jews who have come from a whole series of layered pasts. We came from a long dispersed series of pasts for the past 18, 19 centuries. But before that, we had layers of pasts that went back through the Judean to the Israelite to the Hebrew period, from Ezra back to Isaiah, back to Moses, back to Jacob, back to Isaac, back to Abraham and their spouses and so on. That's the vocabulary from which he's drawing to create this image of 1962. He was not someone who had become instantaneously drawn to or who is particularly known for his focus on the Holocaust. But in fact, he has some outstanding and extraordinary images that deal with that subject. This is um, a large painting done in 1958-59. So a couple of years before the Venus of Beersheba, but well after he had been painting for 20, 20 years since he'd been in Palestine, Israel, obviously longer if you go back to his Bauhaus and pre-Bauhaus phases. And this is the first major image in which he is overtly dealing with the Holocaust. And again, you'll notice it's a triptych. And again, I would point out that's not accidental because triptychs are such a traditional Christian form of visual self-expression that when a Jewish artist uses a triptych, it often, not always, it often connects him or her to the question of where do I fit into the history of Western art, so much of which has been Christian art. In the Holocaust context, and so with Barnett Newman before and now with Mordechai Ardon here, it's an even more intense kind of symbolic statement because after all the triptych is a symbol of God in Christian thought, a God of mercy, and traditionally, Christianity thinks of that God, the New Testament God, the God that Christians focus on as a God of mercy and tend to contrast it with what they misconstrue as the Hebrew biblical God, as a God of anger rather than as a God of mercy, as a God of fierceness rather than a God of love. So for a Jewish artist to use a triptych form that has that kind of symbolism, and in this case, overtly to address the Holocaust has an intense irony to it. Where was that Christian God of mercy at that time? So it's an, a, a fantastic piece. It's called, by the way, Harsh Mass, Misadura. He names it in Latin. Again, the title itself uh, connotes some of the things I was just saying. And I'm just going to zoom in for you on the central section of it for this presentation, which is called Kristallnacht. And everybody knows what Kristallnacht was, the night of broken glass or the night of the pogrom. It's November 9th, 10th, 1938, which was the first time when state-sponsored Nazi violence broke out against Jewish communities across Germany, against Jews, their homes, their shops, their synagogues, dozens and dozens of which were burned and so on and so on and so forth. And the irony is that uh, uh, Himmler was so disgusted by the violence, not the harming of Jews, mind you, but that it was so ugly and violent, he liked clean violence. So that after 38, for the next couple of years, you were safer as a Jew walking down the streets of a German city because the SS rather than the SA was in charge and there was less random hoodlum kind of violence. Of course, the final solution was being prepared. So it was a kind of false calm before a much fiercer storm that by 1941 would uh, emerge with the uh, creation of the first, not only concentration camps, because they've been in operation for a long time, but the first death camps. But anyway, this is Kristallnacht, and you can see everything is torn apart, everything is chaos. A fragment of Torah scroll here, a fragment, fragments of clouds. You can actually see a horizon line, right? So clouds and stars in his traditional style there, and the repeated images of threes, 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 suggesting, I would suggest, the Trinity, again, that question, where is the triune God of mercy? And then this face that is just a 
flat face torn from its antithesis. And we wonder whose face is that? And then we look at all of these strings that remind me when I was a kid, I remember a record cover of uh, My Fair Lady. And it had on the record cover, uh, Julie Andrews being manipulated by strings, with strings by um, her manipulator, you know, My Fair Lady's ma ma manipulator, uh, Henry Higgins. And then there were strings going from him off the top, the suggestion being God was manipulating him who was manipulating her. And I always think of that when I look at this image, because I see these hands from which there hang all these strings that manipulate the action, but then the strings go off. But then I think, wait a second, these aren't just any hands. If you're familiar with art history as Mardon is, you of course have taken the hands directly out of the center of the Sistine ceiling, chapel ceiling in Vatican City, where on the one hand, on the right, you've got the hand of God that is energized, about to touch the very unenergized hand of Adam. So his passivity is about to become activated. It's how Michelangelo conveyed the idea of putting a soul into Adama, earth, that's what Adam means. And in the Hebrew, it says, God breathed its, breathe, its, its living breath into Adam. That's how he becomes animated. Anima in Latin means soul. That's how he becomes be sold. That's how humans, the creation of humans really begins and everything follows thereafter. And then I realized, of course, I recognize that face. It's the face of Adam from the same Sistine ceiling, only it has been transformed from this uh, kind of volumetric flesh and blood figure to just a kind of flat shadow of itself. And we realize that this wholesale destruction, which is what is being discussed here visually in so many different ways, even nine pins being knocked over, is raising a question about destruction over against creation, about that moment when the Lord first made the first human a besold being. Where was that God and where was the human soul when chaos was being mediate, mediate, meted out in such an extraordinary way? In, on Kristallnacht and everything of which it was part. Another Israeli artist, a sculptor, Igal Tumarkin, born in Dresden, Germany in 1933. So he was born about the time Ardon was coming to Palestine. He came here as a, as a child with his family and he lived until 2021. He's mostly known for works of this sort. This is called the Monument to the Fallen Flyer. It's also in the Northern Negev, it's near Arad, and it was done in 1968, which means it was done right after the 1967 June War. And so that's what it's intend to commemorate and connote. And you kind of have a kind of, you kind of have kind of a sensibility of airplane parts here and there and what have you. But of course, everything has become as in Ardon's previous image, but in a different way, flotsam and jetsam. It's just everything strewn, scattered and yet organized. And it's intended not only to suggest a, a paradoxic relationship between the regularized geometric forms that he's using here and there, the circle, the cone, the rectangle, the triangle, and the broken irregularized edges that contrast with it here and there, but the whole work of art, which is after all humanly contrived, contrasts with the desert that sweeps away on the one hand and the sky that sweeps away on the other hand, both of which are entirely irregular and are entirely God-made and not human-made. So there's a kind of dialogue here between what humans make and what gods make. And God, after all, makes the universe, humans make art. So humans function in a certain kind of way in the way that God does, but it's a more limited way. And when an artist speaks of being inspired, of course, traditionally speaking, I don't mean the way we use the word now without thinking about what it means. Traditionally, that word meant inspirited. It meant somehow the gods or God, somehow divinity filled me with the idea of what I just made. We think back to that previous image. Adam is inspirited and he becomes a man. To mark in a very different sense, you see, is inspirited to create this monument. And it's the sort of thing for which he's best known. And I might point out in passing, of course, 
that Israel also marks, even going back to before the state existed, it marks a transition within the whole history of what we might call Jewish art in that, where do you see public sculpture around the planet that is Jewish in content, intent, purpose, or authorship before we get to Palestine and Israel? The answer is, well, nowhere that we know of. Not only because of the sense that if there is any kind of art that might convey idolatry and we're uncomfortable with it, it could be sculpture, but also public sculpture is community made. And what Jewish community in the diaspora would have had the luxury of producing something public that wasn't going to be dismantled sooner than later. So one of the features that is interesting for Israel in general with respect to um, its art is the vast array of public statuary that has as a kind of point and purpose to suggest we're not going anywhere, we're here to stay. But Tumarkin created among his public statues, this one, which is completely not what we usually associate with him. It's called um, the Monument to the Holocaust. It's in Tel Aviv, it's not far from the train station. It's in a very chaotic kind of uh, area and it was done in 1975. And notice, by the way, the way in which the very regularized forms of this sculpture um, both offer a contrast with the natural forms of the trees in the park around it, but also a different kind of contrast with the building and by implication buildings beyond that. And yet on the third hand, with the body of water that is in the foreground, which gives us another version or another uh, uh, yeah, version and vision of that which is nature or God made, like the sky is, like the trees are, to contrast with those elements that are human made. And of course, the sculpture is reflected in the water. The water is part of a reality that is more permanent because it's God made than anything that humans make. And yet the sculpture itself is more permanent than the reflection, which you know, if the winds pick up or the rains pick up, is going to dissipate before our eyes. And of course, the, the lily leaves uh, are there that are also part of a constant, which is nature, and yet they are by definition inconstant because their, their flowers will open up in the morning and close again at night. Of course, they'll open and close and open and close night by day and night by day, which makes them a symbol of a particular kind of constancy, which is why they were so important, for example, to the Egyptians but it's a Holocaust memorial. That most stable of geometric forms as Pythagoras and Plato shared is the triangle, is the pyramid apropos of the Egyptians, but he's turned it upside down because of course, that's what the Holocaust did. As in Ardon's form, creation becomes destruction, order becomes chaos. In Tumarkin sculpture, the norm becomes the abnorm. The right side up becomes the upside down. And it's perhaps not accidental that it's formed not only by the diagonals of a triangle and of a pyramid, but all those verticals give us a kind of sense, do they not, of the bars of some prison cell. And so within or without, we're talking about incarceration, which of course was the first um, uh, order of business for the Nazi system with respect to Jews and others, incarceration, concentration into camps, before the next step was taken, which was extermination. And the irony is you can't quite tell it from the image, but there's a glass between those steel beams. So if you're up close, you can probably both see through and see your reflection. You can see in, but you can't get in, even if you could fit between the bars because there's substance between the bars. So he is eloquently focused on the issue of the Holocaust in a completely abstract way that I would suggest if you didn't know this were a Holocaust monument, you might not recognize as such. You might just think, oh, interesting abstract sculpture. Very different from Maurizio Lasansky, born in 1914, and he lived until 2012, he lived to 98. In Buenos Aires, he was born, and very important to 20th century printmaking. He came to the United States. He is the founder of the printmaking department uh, at University of Iowa, which came to be a renowned printmaking department. And Somehow in the period of the late 50s and early 60s, he got drawn as a Jew to the whole subject matter and the whole issue and the whole idea of the Holocaust. 
this series that he did called the Nazi drawings, very different from anything we've seen up to this point, of course, it couldn't be more explicit, could it, was a lead in 1961 to 1967. It was a long series that took him six years to, to finish. So here you can see this, the uh, apparent uh, dancing hall girl or prostitute in her high heels and her rear end exposed and her breast exposed and her mouth is all we can see of her face because this creature with its bony legs wrapped around her who is vampire-like is digging into her throat it would seem with his feet, with his teeth rather, while his hand covers her face. She has no real face. He is by implication the Nazi who is stripping down the Jew to ugliness, to nothingness, to no faceness, to nakedness of a particularly uh, offensive sort. That was number 12 in the, in the series of drawings. This is number 18. And you can see this is a little bit more straightforward and explicit with respect to that question with which we started with Barnett Newman and picked up with uh, uh, Mordechai Ardon. Where was the church when all of this was happening? How responsible was it? How guilty was it? How innocent was it? What about Pope Pius XII? What did he do? What didn't he do? What could he have done? What should he have done? And so we've got the cross front and center, do we not? And we've got embedded, so to speak, against and within the cross, another cross, which is blood red, as if blood itself is just running down the cross in cruciform. And in lieu of the Christ, who is typically in Christian art shown hanging on the cross, we have this character who is hanging from the cross in a completely different way with that web of strings of ropes that are hanging onto him. And instead of having written over the top what is typical in Christian art, uh, over cross, I-N-R-I, or the words fully written out in Latin or in Latin and Greek or Latin, Greek and Aramaic that stand for the words, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Judeans, Instead of that, it may be hard for you to see it from this distance. It's a, it's a newspaper article, just the headline. And the headline is, kill him. The Germans yell at the SS officer. So we have no doubt here that we are dealing not with the savior of humankind, but a crucified Jew whose crucifixion isn't even worthy of standard issue crucifixion interwoven with the question of how does that sensibility develop over the course of those 18 centuries when Christian art prevailed within Western art and Christianity prevailed across the Europe in which Jews were an archipelago of islands in these vast Christian seas and so many things happened again and again and again. If we turn to again an Israeli artist, to Micha Ullmann, also born like Tumarkin was in 1933, also in Germany, but uh, he's still alive. His work uh, covers a range. He works with photography, he works with installation, uh, but he's particularly known for his sculptures. And this particular one is called Havdalah. I'm giving you two views of it. So Havdalah, of course, as you know, is the the celebration, well, it's not a celebration, it's the marking of the end of the Sabbath and the transition back to the work. Havdalah means separation. And of course, it's the one time in which a Jewish holiday doesn't stop start precisely at sundown. It starts when you can three, see three stars in the sky. Because once you've seen three, you, you actually already have many. You actually can't see three stars. You can see one, it's usually not a star. It's usually a planet, it's usually the planet Venus. By the time you're up to three, and it's the reluctance to let go of the Sabbath that caused us to delay. So he's taken this idea and turned it into something that is completely abstract with his divisions and his subdivisions between um, uh, the, the number four and the number four. Four is the number of letters in God's ineffable name. So we've got this repeating again and again. It's about Godness who imposes upon us the abstraction of Havdalah and the, the, the festival that we celebrate with candles and with wine uh, and with sweet spices to commemorate and to suggest the Shabbat as we move from it. He's turned it all to, into a solid uh, discussion of um, 
the relationship between man-made and natural or God-made elements, as after all, this steel structure, which is so perfectly carefully ordered with all of its diagonals and all of its horizontals and all of its verticals, all those geometric forms falls against and has within it even the pebbles of the irregularities of nature. But Ullmann's most, to my mind, stunning creation um, in recent years, by recent years, I mean the last 30 years or so, is this work done in 1995 in Berlin, and it's called Library. And you can see what he has done. He has opened up and dug into the earth, not built up from it, a perfectly squared space. Down below within it, you can see these are bookshelves, dozens and dozens of bookshelves. Of course, they're completely empty of books. And then he's placed plexi over it, so you can, and he's lit it, so you can both look into it, you can even step on it, but you can look into it from above the surface. So it's a kind of anti-sculpture sculpture, is it not? Because it's sculptures we think of as three-dimensional outcroppings. This is a three-dimensional incropping, so to speak. And of course, it's punning on two issues. It is a Holocaust memorial. It's a memorial to all the destroyed Jews, Jews who are the people of the book as they were first labeled by Muhammad and who for so many years are associated not with images, but with text as people of the book, except it turns out we've produced a lot of imagery as well. And Ullman himself is an example of that. But more to the point, of course, back around 1820, the famous Jewish German poet who converted out of Judaism because the atmosphere was too toxic, even though nominally Jews were emancipated at that point in Prussia for him to stay Jewish. And on his deathbed, he said, it's the biggest mistake I ever made. I, I regret having done so. But who wrote among his works in a play in passing those who burn books, you know, when they burn books, soon they're going to burn people. And this is not just anywhere in Berlin. It's an Alexanderplatz. It's near the Humboldt uh, institution. It's where the first book burnings took place at the hands of the Nazis. So the Nazis burned books. That was one of their great activities early on. And as we know, they soon burned people. And so this is a reference to Heine. It's a reference to the Nazi book burnings. It's a reference to the burning of Jews. It's a reference to the Holocaust from a whole range of different kinds of angles. One last twist and turn back to an American artist, younger, uh, Jeffrey Lawrence, who lives out in Santa Fe, born in 1949, born in the U.S., raised primarily in London. He still has a very heavy uh, London accent. I forgive him that. And ended up moving to Santa Fe, where he's been an artist now for a good number of years. His parents were both Holocaust survivors. His father um, was so bitter about it that he wouldn't let his mother use garlic in the kitchen because he said it's ghetto cooking. And he was hostile to his own Jewish identity. So Jeffrey grew up with very little awareness either of his Jewish identity or of the Holocaust. But as he came into his 30s, he became much more aware, well, of both of them. And among his more interesting works is a triptych that he did in the end of the 1990s. And this is just one part of the triptych. It's called Tefillin. And you can see what he's done is taken the tefillin, the phylactery strap, and wrapped it not around the uh, arm in a proper manner of a man, but not properly wound around the arm of a naked woman and the other two parts of the triptych, and it's vertical, not horizontal, have other body parts with this stuff wrapped around it. And I said to him, when I first saw it, I said, Jeff, the, the nipple ring, is this also about bondage? And he said, oh, I never thought about that, but I think you're right. I guess I didn't realize it was unconscious because the tefillin respond to the commandment to bind it, to wrap it, to bind it for a sign upon your hand and, um, and for frontlets between your eyes. But traditionally, of course, this is not something women do. And so he was both commenting on the idea of being a Jewish artist within the history of Western Christian art by doing a triptych. He was also commenting about the question of where women fit in to traditional Judaism and to the history of art simultaneously. It's not until we get to someone like Gentile uh, uh, Artemeski, who herself 
at the time is not recognized that we have come now to recognize as a brilliant Baroque artist. And it's not until the last decades that women have become more and more prominent within art history, but also there have been transitions within the Jewish tradition where women have different kinds of roles from what, that which, to which they were limited traditionally. And of course, there were many, many Jewish women artists. And um, I apologize because I'm not showing any work by any of them this afternoon. But so this was a play on bondage and binding on a positive and a negative, but his interest in such things gradually led him to a whole series of works that focus on the Holocaust and uh, as he came into the new millennium. So here you're seeing one work, as you can see, it's called Those the River Keeps. It dates from 2004 through 10, it took him six years. And you can see that the Hanukkah menorah, the idea of rededication, of finding the light within the darkness uh, is mimicked by the fact that we've got these eight figures that are attired very obviously as concentration camp victims as they are moving across the waters in this boat without oars, without an oarsman. And yet there's something about it like the, the boat across the river sticks that takes you into Hades, because that's where we're heading. And he has a whole range of, of different works that have a Holocaust connotation of this sort. But the last image I want to show you instead is this one, which is called Is, Was, Will Be, and dates from about the year 2000. Because here he has created again, uh, by intention, a Holocaust image. The guy to the right, you can recognize as an SS officer with the swastika on his uh, uh, armband and the, the hobnail boots, of course, that he, that he is wearing. And you can see that he's got his right arm around and he's kind of presenting as if this is the star and this is the entrepreneur, this skeletal figure that is wrapped in a talit, a Jewish prayer, prayer soul. And the whole thing is rakishly laid in front of a curtain. It's very uh, inspired by Baroque uh, mechanisms in that regard. But the point of this image is to suggest that if as Jews, the only thing we think about is the Holocaust. In the 90s and the beginning of the millennium, that was largely what Jews did. The Holocaust Museum opened, the Spielberg Foundation with its recording of the survivor's testimony began. And it was often, I can speak personally as the director of a small Jewish museum in the 90s in Washington, DC, difficult to get many Jews to realize that we have a 4,000 year history with a lot of it. And it's not just about the Holocaust. It's very important. But if that's all we talk about, if that's all we give to our children, our grandchildren, if that's all we let the non-Jewish world know about, then this is where we end up. We become a skeleton and the Nazis become the entrepreneur who present us to the world instead of our presenting ourselves to the world as we should. So with that in mind, I'll stop, share, open things up for questions with the comment that Yom HaShoah could not be more important, but we also have to remember that it's part of a much larger picture that defines Jewish history and culture and the Jewish condition. I thank you all for listening. So much, Ori. I was busy. There's a very busy chat and Q&A going on. So uh, people respond very strongly to, uh, to what you have said. So uh, where do we start? Um, A question about Barnett Newman. Everybody was irritated, of course, about the white. <laughs> but once they saw, once we all saw the orange, uh, it was a little bit more of a, a qualif uh, you know, uh, there was a hint. That's there. the whole point, you know, you're, you're, there's, there's nothing to see except those little strips are actually gold, by the way. They may have yeah. looked orange, but actually gold. Um, okay, okay. Question, is it, um, uh, is, is the white just, just the the raw canvas, or is it is no, it? No, it, it 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 is not raw canvas. It it is pigment, but it's um it's not primed, so it's just straight pigment on the canvas. So mm -hmm. he's left out the prime, and his intention is to not have 
the Torah, well, as I said, a colorless color, as it were. And by the way, this is different from Morris Lewis in the next half generation, who starts doing without even nothing, raw canvas, where he puts his strips of color, however he does them. Yeah. So there's a question. If, if one didn't know the history of Barnett Newman, couldn't one come to completely different interpretations? Is uh, it is in a sense absolutely. obscure to the uninitiated or? Oh, oh, absolutely it is, but that's my job to, to make it not obscure to the uninitiated. I mean, Clement Greenberg and Harold Rosenberg saw no content in any of the abstract expressionists. And as I said, for now 40 years, I've been banging on, that's not true. No artist doesn't think about the world. And these guys were in their studios with each other talking about Isaac Luria, the 16th century Safed, Kabbalists, they were talking about the Holocaust. They were not unaware of it, but Newman and Rosenberg, I'm sorry, the Greenberg and Rosenberg and everybody who followed their lead, either out of unawareness or out of self-denial, these are both Jewish critics. They don't want to see too much Jewish going on here because that was not comfortable in the 50s. Mm -hmm. Said, oh, it's all about, it's all about form. There's no content there. Mm -hmm. The abstract expressionists don't put frames which traditionally literally separate what's in the painting from what's outside. It's the first time that's happening in art. So literally the painting, so to say, is not separated from the outside world. Again, as a kind of symbolic statement. And often they're, they're huge paintings, of course. So they're about, it's about a tikkun olam, which is what Luria is about in the 16th century Kabbalah. That's what Newman and Rothko and Gottlieb are about on the canvas, the microcosm of the canvas, putting the universe back together. But absolutely, if you don't know, you wouldn't know because you, you know, how would you know? Mm -hmm. Right, true. So uh, Paul is, is writing, which is kind of goes into, yeah, into the same direction. When I saw a Barnett Newman painting at MoMA, I spontaneously burst into tears. You need to see them in real life and I, do True. believe that as well. It's the same with Rothko, with, yeah. with uh, abstract. Yeah, absolutely. It's all art, actually. <laughs> That's the truth. Um, and then uh, Pearl is also uh, asking where the paintings are exhibited. So someone said uh, Judith saw them at the National Gallery in, in Washington. Are you talking um, about Barnett Newman? Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. You're talking about Barnett Newman? Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the name is definitely there. The, the Stations of the Cross were there, I think they're still there. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been a lot of places, but I believe they're in a permanent, and, and you can see sort of the corridor of the 14 and then B at the end. Um, so you really get a sense, if you're sensitive to what I think he's doing abstractly, that sense of Golgotha to, I mean, uh, Via Dolorosa to Golgotha. Mm -hmm. Right, right, so, uh... Fancy is asking, how large is Fallen Flyer? The oh, it's huge. Uh, I, I would say, um, give or take, uh, across, left to right, you know, about 50 feet and about 40 feet high. It's a big, big work. You don't typically see it from close up. If you go to the edge of Arad, you, you see it sort of in, it's not quite in the distance, but it's in the distance. It's kind of outside of town. You can go to it, but it's interesting to see. If you see it from that distance, it even more has this, this sense of like a plane that has crashed than when you're up close. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wonderful. So Iris is asking where Lawrence's work is. Is it, you said he lives in, in Santa Fe? And mo mostly it's, it's in his studio. Uh, you can imagine that's not stuff that sells easily. Mm -hmm. uh, his gallery doesn't want to deal with his Holocaust stuff at all. Mm -hmm. um, so. I can uh, happily put you in touch with him if you're interested, or you can, if you look him up, L-A-U-R-E-N-C-E -E and Jeffrey, G-E-O-F-F-R-E-Y, you'll come upon his website and you can find him. Yeah, the information is also on, on our website, like the name and everything. So, and Judith uh, just confirms that the, the, the Bonnet Newmans are still in the- there. Yeah. Okay, good. Um, yeah, uh, so. Joseph is writing, is, uh, writing, my wife and her survivor parents saw the Lazansky Nazi drawings when it was when they were at the Whitney. At the Whitney in 67. Yeah. yeah, that's a long time ago. Bit ago. That, that was <laughs> you know, when, when modern art museums were not afraid to exhibit that sort of stuff. 
Yeah, yeah. Which is a very good point because we are just preparing an exhibition in Germany in Leipzig, uh, and they think that they they're discussing having extra police uh, protection wow. uh, because it's a Jewish subject. So, wow, um, times are changing. Um, yeah. Uh, so. Uh, Ruth Strauss's question, yes, I believe that is a replica, one of many, yeah. Okay. The stations of the Cross up there in Canada, yeah. Right. They were exhibited in the flesh in a number of different places. So if you saw them in the past somewhere else, you may actually have seen them. Okay. So, and both also... Uh, yeah, so are there more question coming because Ruth also says it's an amazing illumination of art that would otherwise be undecipherable. So please let him know. So here we go. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. That's why they pay me the big bucks, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so do we have any more questions? Because otherwise, excellent thought-provoking presentation. I think we all agree here. Excellent! Wow! Thank you. Um, okay, you can you can say those. <laughs> but I, I really do. I do. Okay, and Jenny is asking, who's a woman artist who fits into this? Uh, well, there are a number. Uh, not necessarily Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, although uh, Judy Chicago well after she did her famous dinner party, did this huge Holocaust project. And it's, it's extensive and it's you know filled with all kinds of ideas. Um, she's also someone who claims that she didn't really know much about the Holocaust until uh, she was having a conversation with a Christian friend. So I, this I don't understand, but, but I guess it's true. But if I'm thinking of women artists who address this question of Jews in Western Christian art, women in Judaism, women in Jewish, uh, in, in Jewish women in Christian Western art. I think, for example, of Susan Schwal, who did a spectacular series called the Creation Series. And to, uh, to take the Barnett Newman triptych idea and then juxtapose it with that series is really uh, kind of stupendous. But there are loads of them, um, I, uh, too many uh, to mention because it's, it's a very interesting uh, topic. And within what I would call the field of Jewish art, by which I mean Jewish artists, but I don't mean to use that to define Jewish art, um, you can just see this explosive expansion of uh, extraordinary stuff done by women artists starting in the 70s and just, you know, every decade there are more and more and more and more and more and more diverse and more and more interesting. And it's just crazy. The Jewish Art Salon in New York, check them out if you're interested, just in checking on Jewish artists in general, but you will find a lot of both male and female uh, artists who are very, very interesting uh, if, you, if you look them up and get in contact with them. Mm -hmm. And they didn't pay me to advertise. <laughs> 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 if you're on the Patasha side, actually, if you look at, what, at, at our, um, one, uh, two of our online exhibitions, the one on Alice Lakahana and her offspring and offspring, but also the one on uh, identity art and um, what am I missing? My identity God. art and migration, thank you. Um, there are a number of, of very interesting women artists, uh, part of that discussion, you know, beginning with Ava Hesse um, and so on and so forth. Very true, yes, yes, exactly. Okay, thank you so much, Ori. Um, that was really illuminating. I also, I keep learning new things. Uh, thank you so much. I want to conclude uh, with words from Elie Wiesel who has said, to forget the dead would be aching to killing them a second time. So on this year's Yom HaShoah, let's vow to never forget.